Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. As the 20th century comes to an end, scholars around the world are looking back at the last 100 years and asking, what happened? Today's guest, Sir Martin Gilbert, is a distinguished British historian who has thought a great deal about that question. Sir Martin is the official biographer of Winston Churchill. He has written extensively about World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust. A fellow of Merton College, Oxford, he is most recently the author of Israel, A History, and the first volume of A History of the 20th Century. Two more volumes are in the works, chronicling the events, personalities, and ideas that have shaped the past hundred years. The topic before the house, Martin Gilbert's 20th Century, this week on Think Tank. Welcome, Sir Martin Gilbert. Um, I came across a quote recently by uh, the American tycoon Andrew Carnegie, which he uh, uttered or wrote in the year 1900. And he said, ere the 20th century closes, the earth will be purged of its foulest shame, the killing by men in battle under the name of war. Uh, what, was that the, uh, the general view of thinking people at around the turn of the last century? Absolutely. People felt that uh, the wars that were taking place in 1900, of which there were some, the British in South Africa, all of us in China, that these would come to an end very quickly, and that certainly civilized men would never fight each other again. It was becoming inconceivable. And Norman Angel, who'd worked in California as a young man, a British writer, wrote this wonderful book in 1909, The Great Illusion, where he said there's no way the great nations can fight because they know that if they fight, they'll destroy their whole economic structures. Sounds very familiar. He got the Nobel Prize for this forecast. Uh -huh. the, 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 uh, in your book on Winston Churchill, uh, you quote him in 1922 uh, on the fourth anniversary of the World War I armistice, and he says, what a terrible disappointment the 20th century has been. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, the change in attitude from the first statement of Carnegie's, everything's going to be great, and here's Churchill, we're only 22 years into the century, and he's already saying it's a disaster. Well, when he was a bright young man, uh, Churchill, before World War I, he also came to the conclusion that what he called the interdependence of trade and traffic would mean that there was no way in which nations that were engaged in trade and traffic would fight. And when he became First Lord of the Admiralty in charge of the British Navy, he was absolutely astounded when he proposed to the German Kaiser that they stop building ships in competition to fight each other. He thought this was the next stage. And of course, after World War I, the idea of disarmament, naval, air, military disarmament, was the next stage of abolishing war for all time. But in the interim had come World War I. Churchill himself had fought for a while in the trenches. He'd seen how appalling it was. And he was convinced that somehow mankind, the great powers, the imperial powers, had lost their way. And what he was talking about in his terrible 20th century was also Bolshevism, the rise of Bolshevism in Russia, the turmoil in Asia. He saw everything disintegrating. He was actually quite depressed at that time. Um, yet, at, at the same time, as I sense it, certainly here in America, there was a, uh, an ascendant track in terms of income and food and wealth and transportation, communications. I mean, how do you explain, for example, the, the horror of the geopolitics, this mass killing in World War I, when at the same time there's this enormous progress. Have you sort of grappled with that? Well, it, it is the story of the 20th century, and, and in a way, the more progress, not only economic progress, but incredible medical progress, progress in communications, the more progress, the more these terrible things seem to happen, but people relegated it. I mean, it's interesting that in the aftermath of World War I, when the League of Nations was 
convinced that he could put in place, and it did eventually put in place with the help of an American, Kellogg, mm -hmm. the abolition of war for all time, because it will fulfill Andrew Carnegie's vision in the early 1930s. At that very moment, wars were fighting between Russia and Poland, wars in China, wars in Africa, and people said, well, they're nothing to do with progress. <laughs> Regress has nothing to do with progress, so we can set it aside. They didn't relate, as it were, the killings that continued with their own signatures abolishing killing. As a, an author of 50 books, um, mostly about this century, uh, does this give you sort of a perspective on what we might be headed for? And does, does this uh, push you into sort of discounting some of the current rhetoric? Well, I'm always quite impressed by the intention, the desire of world leaders and even populations to abolish war. It, it has been a theme. One of the high points in my volume one of the 20th century is before World War I, all the great nations got together, including yours and mine, and abolished aerial warfare. Uh, there'd, there'd almost been none of it. I think the Italians had bombed the Turks in their war with Turkey in 1912. But they said, no, enough. We will never use aerial bombardment as a way of war. Well, of course, in two world wars it was, and in the second it was a decisive and terrifying element. But the instinct to then sit down and say, let's start again, let's get it right. Now, it's not only rhetoric, I think, and of course enormous hours and energies and very great people. I mean, I think, for example, of General Marshall and the Marshall Plan. This was an exceptional piece of social and international engineering, and it was genuine, it was effective. and. There are always people and governments who will do this, who will try to put in place uh, something that will be effective. When the 20th century began, the great majority of nations were not democratic. They were either monarchies or uh, autocracies of, of one sort or another. You now have a situation where the majority of the nations in the world, and I think even a majority of the population now, is governed under democratic rule. That seems to be the direction in which things are going. Is that, uh, in your judgment, an authentic trend, one that will continue? One, is that a one that is a hallmark of this century, more liberty? Well, I wouldn't call it a trend because in the main it's rather recent. I mean, the collapse of the Soviet empire, the, the famous evil empire, uh, has taken place in the last decade of the 20th century. So in a way, uh, if we were writing the history of the 20th century in 1990, one would say that enormous areas of the globe were under some form or other of totalitarianism or the impact of totalitarianism. Now everything has changed, but we don't know what it's changed for. We don't know what 2000 will bring in that regard. So I'm personally not all that optimistic. I mean, this sense that you and I and, and democracy and liberalism has done well is certainly true where we stand today. And one could argue certainly that World War II was fought to make sure that <laughs> the border of totalitarianism was, was pushed back as far as possible. But I wouldn't have thought there was necessarily an inevitable continual progression. And of course the question of China continues to bedevil everybody. Would you, um, would you accept the idea that there has been a, uh, a long trend, a, long, a recent long trend, more than a blip, um, away from command economies, socialist economies, mixed economies, and toward a market economy? I would. Again, it's, it's something that has accelerated recently. And perhaps looking back over the century will prove to have been the most long-term or significant development. But goodness me, it was fought against by all our countries in a way, in different ways for a long time. Is the situation in, uh, in England now, I mean, with uh, Prime Minister Blair sort of accepting the Thatcherite uh, changes, does that have a sense of permanence about it? It does, and I think it's an extraordinary reflection on how the century has moved on, that the change of British socialism to, if you like, the Thatcherism with a kindly face, uh, has not led to social revolution, social upheaval, or even much social dissent. Um, th th there's this 
law called Murphy's Law. You're probably familiar with it. If it can go wrong, it will go yeah. wrong <laughs> at, at the worst possible time. And there is a, a O'Toole's corollary, which is Murphy was an optimist. If you had to speculate, uh, when does Murphy come next and under what disguise? Well, I think Murphy's great strength is he, he pops up where he's not expected. Uh, I mean, I, I, I myself am very interested in the, in the former Soviet Union and in the whole Russian aspect mm -hmm. and the way in which you know, we devoted so much of our intellectual energy in Britain and the United States in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to fighting and demanding human rights in, in Russia. Now that's happened, and yet has it happened? I mean, I think this is where Murphy plays his tricks. We, we like to feel that everything eventually is ordered rather well. True also about the economy. Mm -hmm. you know, we've got it right. Uh, we, we, we must feel we've got it right because it's been got wrong so often in the past. I mean, look how the collapse of the German economy in the 20s and 30s somehow uh, created the climate for Nazism. So we sitting here feel that this can't happen now. We can't have that sort of lurch into disintegration, which will then have these terrifying repercussions. Talk to me for a moment about <coughs> the, uh, let's just jump around, the, the anti-colonial story and how that, that plays out. And I, I, I want to come to uh, Palestine slash Israel when, when we do that. When and how does that develop in this century? Well, when the century began, the, the, one of the sort of pr most proud elements within the British Empire was that Canada and Australia were, mem were independent members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Nobody thought to ask, well, why is it called the British Commonwealth? Uh, in recent times, the word British has rightly been dropped. It, it's just called the Commonwealth it's of Nations. It's now the Commonwealth, but it used to be the British Commonwealth. And that was thought to be, in a way, the, the most triumphant <laughs> anti-colonialism uh, that you could have. But there was no doubt in anybody's mind that uh, Indians, Africans, Asians were people over whom the Europeans and the United States, if it was willing to participate, had to assert its primacy and its superiority. And it took a long time before this attitude was whittled away. I mean, even in the 1950s and 60s, you have the French struggling to retain their empire in, in Indochina, in Vietnam, in North Africa. You have the British very reluctant until 1960 to, to give it up, trying all sorts of devices to maintain it. And I think anti-colonialism really is it, it's a very powerful theme. And the, the way in which the, the fighters for independence were terrorists, they were uh, prisoners, they were hated. I mean, I was brought up as a schoolboy to regard uh, certain people, I mean, Kenyatta, Makarios, as absolute villains, murderers. And strange then to see them riding in their Rolls Royces to the Commonwealth Conference at Marlborough House as the guests of Her Majesty the Queen in all their finery. And uh, it's quite an adjustment to make, but uh, it was made. Let's come back to the United States in a moment. You mentioned India and Palestine and immediately following World War II, 1947, 1948. Are, are those the first two uh, successful anti-colonial movements the, that the, where, where, they, where, where, where the, the colonized actually throw off foreign rule? They were. I mean, the, the tragedy about both was that the, the original intention of the British government, both towards India and Palestine, was benign. Uh, it was hoped that the Indians would advance towards self-government, and it was hoped that the Jews would eventually have their national home, their autonomy, and even their statehood, which was proposed initially by Britain in 1937, a Jewish state. But both movements soured. Both, in both countries, the British found it difficult to relinquish control, and therefore national movements grew, which became more violent and more determined to, to push the process quicker. And so both these imperial uh, experiments, if you like, ended in great bitterness. And that also, I think, impeded the British personality for a while, the feeling that we had lost our empire, we, we had been cheated, perhaps, of our empire. Instead of <coughs> going out gracefully, it, it went out. Exactly. With, with and of course, then, uh, in 1956, instead of finally saying, let us be gracious, we, together with the French, uh, 
attacked Egypt, tried to regain control uh, of the Suez Canal. Against the French and the Israelis. And the Israelis. <coughs> and there, of course, you know, the relations with the United States hit an all-time low, and that's when anti-Americanism uh, raised its ugly head again. But it was an incredible imperial adventure, I'm sure, on paper, totally justified. And yet, in retrospect, what an extraordinary thing to think you could do without the United Nations, without the agreement of the United States, without some general international consensus. How has Israel worked out? Well, I, I hope it's not unfashionable to say so, but I, I think Israel's is, is probably the most extraordinary success story of all the, the new nations created in the century. Uh, partly because it started life as an independent country with about 600,000 people, small. It now has more than 5 million. It, it's an even greater rate of immigration and absorption than was faced here in the United States, say, at the turn of the century. And that was fairly massive, this tremendous influx of immigration which built and created America. Israel has had to do that in a terribly short time and has done it and, and has, has coped with it. And the other thing, I think, is they were surrounded by enemies, sad though it is to say it. They were harassed, not recognized, attacked, invaded, abused by all their neighbors, not to have one friendly neighbor. I mean, the United States has always had Canada, uh, which has been affable and hasn't got many other neighbors. I think only one to the south. We, and, we, uh, <coughs> we have nice peaceful oceans. <laughs> yeah, and you have a lot of ocean. Right. And Israel simply had his back to the sea. And it survived that. It, it survived it partly in war and, and bloody and terrible war, as war always is, and partly by putting together packages, uh, starting with Menachem Begin and the Camp David Agreement, and then Shamir and the Madrid Conference, and then Rabin and, and Perez, and now presumably Netanyahu and Arafat, uh, to be able in those circumstances to piece together uh, treaties and elements of agreement. And, and I think, you know, of course, from afar, it looks such a disturbed place. But I live two or three months of the year there, and uh, from day to day, it's uh, you know, incredibly, not only normal, but actually rather inspiring to see this melting pot and, and vigor. And I promised we would come back to the United States of America. Uh, what, what do you make of America's role in this century? How, how would you sum that up? Well, I think I'm, I'm biased because, first of all, uh, I feel very strongly that, that Britain's survival in 1940-41 depended upon the United States. And although it wasn't always easy for Roosevelt and those who shared his view to make the commitment, they made an incredible commitment, not only sending of arms and materials and helping with transatlantic patrols, but the whole sort of moral backing that they really were behind the survival of Britain. And I, I think that, that was, was so important. And it interests me, for example, that in Churchill's papers, which I published and, and tried to analyze, he kept his eye open for any expression of anti-Americanism by any of his ministers or subordinates. He scrutinized the speeches of the American ambassador here in Washington. Lord Halifax, for anything that could be construed as a criticism. He said, we can't do it. And I found in his papers, and I brought it in my 20th century history, that in 1907 he came to the conclusion that there was no way, of course Britain still had its empire and Britain was powerful, but the reality was that the United States was the power and that the great powers were a game. They were deceiving themselves that Austria-Hungary was not a great power, that the Tsarist Empire was not a great power. It might have great <laughs> powers of uh, tyranny, and it might even have enormous armies which could be sent to their deaths. But, it, but he understood the wealth of America. When the, the uh, terrible crash came here, uh, he was one of the very few people that he had... In the 1930s. Right, he, was one of the, he, had, he had considerable American stocks. And he was one of the very few people who said, this is simply a blip, right? The, the, the real strength of America is not in the stock market and is not in the banks. The real strength is in the prairies and the industry and in the energy of the American people. And it, and it, will, it will return. And so he, he tried to even strengthen the zeal of his American stockbroker. And I think again after World War II, I mean I as a, as a young man traveled around war devastated Europe. And I remember once in Yugoslavia, in communist Yugoslavia, 
being part of a debate of students, I was a young student, and the whole theme was American tyranny, American imperialism, and uh, I listened to this, and then I said, look, I, this is very interesting to me, but what are we sitting on? We're not sitting on chairs, we're sitting on boxes. And these were boxes of, uh, it said, this uh, grain is the gift of the people of the United States, this sugar is the gift of the people of the United States. I said, can they be all that evil <laughs> if they're providing you with grain and sugar? And uh, it, it sort of was a political lesson for me. And I, you know, when I came to uh, to write my history of the 20th century, I, I was fascinated to see that although, of course, profit and, uh, and what we call economic imperialism always has its part, there was an element of altruism going through the papers of Roosevelt and Truman and even Eisenhower. Tremendous element of, of altruism, of feeling, perhaps even of outrage in the American breast that the Europeans and others had got it so wrong, were making such a mess of their lives, and that America had the ability and perhaps the responsibility to intervene positively. Has there ever been a more influential country in the history of the world than America at the end of the 20th century? Not for the good, of course. <laughs> it's, very, it's very easy for influential countries to seek uh, advantage. And I always feel sorry when there is, I mean, I've. I've done in my Atlas of American History maps of each of the American post-war initiatives, often within the United Nations framework, starting with the Korean War, which was a United Nations war, but which the United States sustained. And it's an incredible compilation when you looked at it in map form, that all over the globe, I mean, what did the United States have to go to Somalia for? And yet it went. A lot of people ask that question <laughs> still. Right. But it went, and right. uh, in as much as something you know, could be done, it's sought to do it. What were the highest and lowest points of the 20th century? The lowest point must have been the Holocaust era. Uh, not only the destruction of six million Jews, but all that went with that, including the destruction also by the Germans of more than three and a half million Soviet soldiers who had been captured and were murdered after capture. And during that era, somehow the deliberate killing of so many civilians, not to say that Stalin or Mao didn't have numbers, uh, vast numbers also of victims, but this was, was something grotesque and was a low point. Yeah. As to the high point, uh, I move it around. I mean, I, I, I still do feel that a high point was the kellogg briand Pact in the ni late 1920s, abolishing war for all time, because I think it, it set an aspiration. Uh, so perhaps the real high point will come next year or the year after. We've still got two years left to fulfill that aspiration of, of global harmony. But, but we're uh, near a high point now. I mean, things are, for the moment, working out pretty well. It, it must be, mustn't it? Right. Uh, even though we have, I mean, I believe I'm right in saying more refugees today, 30 million or so than we've ever had in human history, in enormous areas of poverty. but. They are somehow on the margin. I don't know, it's, it's something we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. How, because life generally has so many opportunities and, and so many benefits, we all the more easily marginalize the things which are horrendous. I mean, in my uh, city, London, uh, the number of what we call rough sleepers, the number of people who sleep in the streets at night, and the number of people who line up in the soup kitchens in the morning to have their one or meal. It, it's large, it's visible, and yet even that is somehow terribly unfortunate, not really part of our, our daily life. Who, who was the, uh, the most compelling and most important person in this century, in your judgment? The common man. It used to be called the century of the common man. And someone once said to Churchill, who was a wise old bird, they said, uh, Churchill, why is it called the century of the common man? And he thought a moment and he said, because in this century, it is the common man who has suffered most. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Martin Gilbert. And thank you very much for Think Tank. I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to 
New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.